We are back from the break. I'd like to introduce the panelists of today's debate. Uh, the debate will be moderated by Associated Professor, um, just a second, Pavel Jelinek. Yes, I, I'm not sure about the name, so I, I need to check. I need to check. And we have three successful Czech applicants here today. So welcome um, Alena Zíková from the Biology Center of the Czech Academy of Sciences. Andrzej Dušek from the Faculty of Mathematics and Physics of the Charles University. And online we have Matthew Rampley from the Faculty of Arts of the Masaryk University. And also, and also we are glad to have here on board today uh, Ladislav Čoček, who works as a project officer at the Masaryk University at the Rectorate and helps Hello. ERC applicants at the Masaryk University. And online we have Adela Jeroutkova, who has institutional support um, for Charles University applicants. And now I'd like to pass the floor to our moderator, who will okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So take care of the I mean, debate. We, yes. we learn a lot about all technicalities of ERC, uh, how to apply, and, and what are the grant schemes. But probably the best is to learn from from the success. So probably it will be great to 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 hear the voices of those who were successful. And also we have a two guys, basically, or two persons who support. And so I would just start to kick off this discussion. And I would like to ask you with your personal experience, and especially, let's say, start with that why you apply, or how do you came to the idea to apply for ERC, or what was for your important? So if you just me, me and start with yeah. you. Yeah, we'll start from <laughs> the left. <laughs> Uh, so the question was what motivated me to apply for the ERC and I think that we learned immediately uh, during the talk of uh, Professor Strakos that the science is our passion. So it's that's what motivates us. You know? We want to, and in Czech Republic and everywhere else, if you want to do your job, your science, your passion, you need to get money from somewhere. They are not drawing on the tree, unfortunately. So the passion for doing the science that I want, that was the main driver uh, for me to apply for the ERC. But the science is also our job. And I think that it's the part of the job. Nobody should question that. Whoever is the PI should immediately get into it. It's, um, and also I like the comment of Michal Hotzer that it should become a standard, that you just don't think about it applying, you just go and apply. So that would be my opinion on that. So thank okay. you. Thanks, yeah, okay, so yeah, I, I agree that yeah, what mostly motivated me, but yeah, I needed uh, to get uh, get funding for my research. And, but to be honest, I probably would be thinking more about, uh, I don't know, European consortium grants or national grants or these kind of things. And what motivated me to specifically apply for ERC was, I guess, mostly these kind of events and, and the support at the university and, um, also the fact that I, I had a, a Primus grant at, from, from Charles University, which kind of requires you to apply for a large European grant at the, at the end. And it, it kind of motivates people to, uh, to basically be on the lookout for, for these kinds of uh, so, kind so of high risk, high gain. So may I ask grants. if you will not be receiving the, uh, the Primus program, where basically this is kind of condition, you would not apply for that? I <laughs> guess I would probably not be thinking primarily about ERC. I would not uh, have had the like confidence to apply to, to this. I, I would, I would probably go. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this would be great, but it's too hard, so I'm not gonna do it. But you mean hard in the terms of shaping the ideas or? in heart in terms of, or that you're afraid that you, you are not good enough for this uh, competition. Exactly. Yeah. That, so, but I, maybe I, I, then you got it. So it's good example that probably we are underestimates ourselves. So yeah, there should be yeah. 
that should be main message or one of the main messages for many people mm. uh, at audience, whatever, that we are not so bad in Czech Republic mm. and maybe we can get it. So. <laughs> it's typical Czech behavior you know, that we underestimate ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Good. So, and then we had the third. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, well, I applied because I was told. Uh, to be <laughs> um, and, and what I mean by that, uh, slightly disconcerting seeing myself on the screen there anyway. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is simply, I, well, I, I already had a project that I, where I had two researchers. And so um, um, I was concerned to try and find some follow up projects because we worked well as a team. And so the sense was, well, where do we go from here and the ERC? Um, which, I mean, in my own institution in, in, in Britain, we had very little experience of actually, but, um, but it seemed like a, an attempt to, to, to you know, look after. I, I had a sense of obligations to my, to my re researchers. Um, but also, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I was, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the research office uh, and uh, my boss at the university, it's just, it was just an expectation, you know, there was this sense that, you're a professor, of course should you should apply for this. <laughs> um, and so that's really part of, I guess, British academic culture. You know, you can't, you don't really have the option to say no. Um, but can I just say something to, to this sense of, uh, I mean, I was, I did feel intimidated at first because I thought I can't possibly be good enough for this. You know, I, I'm not, you know, but of course I did apply. And, and of course I was, um, um, I was successful, which is great. And, and, and now, um, um, having been a reviewer as well and a panelist for the ERC, I, I feel kind of much more confident, uh, in fact, as well. Um, and I think it is important to to um, to not feel um, not feel intimidated by the ERC. And you, to, uh, I mean, just to sort of, as Andre said, just just try it. You know, I mean, you've got nothing to lose apart from the time it takes to to, to write the application. Um, and, and and one other thing, um, which I think is important to say here, is that uh, uh, sometimes I come across these ideas from colleagues in the Czech Republic that there's some kind of conspiracy against researchers from Central and Eastern Europe. And that's really completely rubbish as an idea. It's really, really not true at all. Um, but we might come to that later, so I'll, I'll, that's probably enough. I okay. don't need to say anything okay. more. Thanks. Yeah, can I, please. Can I add something to it? Because uh, when I applied for my first ERC starting run, it was 12 years ago, I didn't even know what I'm applying to. And then I checked the date before the deadline, who did it who died it last year and I start trying because I thought that this is not a chance and my husband told me we already wrote it let's submit it so I submitted and then I didn't get it but I got this evaluation score A and I got the ERC check so it's just the you just maybe should just go for it and now when we know who is getting it just go and check and you find out that you know there are even people on the worst let's say this stupid metrics, age index and uh, citations, and they are receiving these grants because it's really about the idea. So we should not feel intimidated by this ERC aura that is around us. Yeah. yeah. Can I say something more, more actually about sure. that, which is that, that um, because I was at the, um, uh, I was recently at, recently at a panel meeting of the ERC and they specifically do not use citations because um, you know, because they subscribe to uh, the Dora um, and, and which, you know, has argued that citation counts, H index and all the rest of it should not be used as a measure of research quality. Um, so in that regard, I think, you know, it's still used in, in various institutions in the Czech Republic and it's, it's kind of behind the curve. But, but, I, I, but I agree with uh, you, you, what you're saying, because also, actually, when I um, looked at some of the projects that were actually funded and I did the same thing what do they look like you know and I sort of say well that's that's quite good but it's not brilliant and I think it's important not to be intimidated by the rhetoric you know because people people use this awful phrase high risk high gain which I just think is personally I think it's meaningless actually it's just it's just rhetoric it's just you know propaganda but it just as long as it's a good idea and it's coherent and all the rest of it then it's important just to say you've got nothing to lose and and even if you're not successful 
uh, you know, even the whole process of putting together a bid is a really valuable experience because it means it's forced you to to think about your research in a different way because it's on a larger scale. So yeah. So so maybe we should say that also it's kind of like uh, even though you will not succeed, it probably is beneficial for your future because you you can think about your your research on long term and and make make some some goals or some horizons to you. So that's what you mean? Absolutely. And I think this is particularly the case for people in the humanities and the social sciences, because people in the in the natural sciences, they're used to working in teams and it's just part of the culture. But but in uh, the, you know, the humanities, where people usually just think just about the next book they want to write, you know, they're just mm. often thinking in a very small scale. But I think obviously the expectation with the ERC is that it should be a much more ambitious project. Um, and that makes you uh, think a bit differently about your research and you have to think on a bigger canvas. And yeah, you have to think further ahead, uh, definitely. definitely. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a good exercise. Yep. So maybe now we can ask also from the other side, no? from those who help us to, what, what they think about this motivation and, and, and how they see us applicants uh, be prepared to apply for ERC. Well, uh, of course, we are happy for, for every researcher and we are uh, ready to support every researcher that, uh, that uh, goes uh, for an ERC. Uh, and um, yeah, I feel like I, I can speak for Masaryk University. I, I, I feel we have too few applicants actually. So uh, one thing is that people don't dare to apply. The other thing is that uh, they sometimes land in conditions which don't really uh, motivate them to, to, to seek independence and apply for grants such as, uh, as an ERC. So we got some set of questions that we are asked to prepare for and, and one thing that I noted uh, in first place was thinking about uh, what, what keeps us from having more successful ERC, uh, ERC grantees or ERC applicants is uh, that we actually have lack of people who are in position to, to go for the ERC. Not like that there would not be people coming to our universities, but rarely they get some sort of independence in terms of... So uh, you mean in, like young scientists? That basically... Young scientists especially. I'm not talking about uh, scientists in the uh, advanced category. That would be a very specific uh, talk. Matthew is one exception at uh, uh, our university, and he actually didn't come from, from uh, our environment originally. But we have very few applicants for advanced grants uh, in, in general. And, well, even people who, uh, who would probably have uh, the profile uh, and ideas to do that, they, uh, for some reason, uh, I don't know if they are intimidated. They are, maybe it's, uh, it could be the case, maybe it could be that uh, People are just, they, they, they know that they will be successful in our, uh, uh, in our uh, funding agencies and they just don't want to see any rejection, to see any criticism to their work, which they will see. I, I know of a few cases where, where advanced uh, researchers applied for ERCs. They got some feedback from the from the panel said it was rubbish and they are not going to apply again. That's an actual case, and it's a bit more difficult to to uh, argue with advanced grantees. Uh, young people are more uh, more open-minded. Uh, so if you want more ERC grants, uh, the uh, way to do, uh, from my point of view, uh, is uh, to be more active in terms of recruitment and to recruit people specifically as team leaders and principally investigators. Okay, they can be academics, but there should be some sort of uh, expectation towards them that they will lead their research team besides mm. teaching or whatever. And they should get the, uh, the conditions to do that. So they should have uh, uh, some sort of budget control in their departments, uh, which is often not non-existent. They just live somewhere on the edge of uh, whatever money flows through the department, uh, some larger department where uh, 
uh, there's there's no, no no systematic beyond that. They might end up with some of their grants, uh, but they don't have much much freedom beyond that. Uh, so so working systematically with with providing people with independence and condition for independent research is, uh, I believe, quite important. So so what uh, how how the, your dean is look uh, is is what is his opinion about your opinion? <laughs> Uh, I'm not asking about anyone's opinions. That's <laughs> the magic. This, I mean, here we, uh, we touch the fundamental uh, problem of, of our institutions. Is that basically the young uh, scientists? There is no freedom for them to, to get yeah. independent sufficiently. Yeah. And yeah, I, um, I, I can tell why, why I uh, why I have this uh, opinion. I, I, I worked for quite a few years at SATEC, where this was actually the practice. And it was. Okay, a source of uh, a lot of discontent for some people that there was uh, a push to have some clarity in terms of career system. Mm -hmm. So when someone was hired as postdoc, they were on a fixed term and they were expected to, uh, if, if they were in future going to apply for ERCs, they were expected to, to apply elsewhere. So the only people who were uh, uh, going to be supported with uh, ERC applications were uh, team leaders, group leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think it's a, 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 a good practice in, in a way that uh, people know what they can expect, it, uh, expect what perspective they have, what, uh, uh, how far does their support uh, stretch. So they have a position in their organization, they uh, uh, have uh, some uh, perspective to be evaluated if they deliver some good results, like over five years or something like that, they may get some permanent position, but they are on this track uh, to become uh, team leaders and uh, yep. uh, they can apply for, for the ERCs. They are expected to apply for the ERCs. Of course, uh, science is more flexible, more diverse uh, than that, uh, but it is good that the people know what they can actually expect from their uh, current position. So, so they don't land in some murky pool where uh, they have no orientation of uh, where, where it might lead them in, in the near future. So maybe we can also ask Adela if she can contribute somehow to this discussion or some opinion about if you have something to say. But also, you have to be prepared for um, uh, for ERC for for what it is actually. And uh, people at, Ch at uh, Charles University, and I think it's whole Czech Republic, are not um, used to receiving um, objective uh, critique, and it's they and they take it very personally. And they are of very often discouraged to apply and also uh, to work with us. So uh, I would say that the key is communication uh, well in advance and also the career development at each university. This is something what is very underestimated in Czech Republic, I would say. And it's obvious that not everybody will apply for ERC in the end, but what about the other researchers? They they need also uh, career development. So I would say that uh, these two things are essential. And also uh, importance uh, of ERC must be perceived also at the level of the faculties because speaking uh, um, from Charles University, which is very a huge university, uh, it is necessary to have um, uh, ERC pipelines at the level of the faculty and vice, vice deans for research should be much more involved and take um, ERC as their responsibility and as their priority. Can, can I add something? Yep, sure. Yep, sure. Go ahead. Uh, just to support what Adela and Ladislav have said, actually, because obviously I found it very interesting, uh, you know, comparing the British. Uh, academic culture with the Czech academic culture and there's I'm not going to say that everything in Britain is brilliant because it isn't and, and obviously that's one of the reasons why I left um, but in this regard you know Britain has always British universities have always been much more successful and, and, and I would actually disagree with Ladislav in one sense I think that the problem in the Czech Republic is that academics have too much freedom so for example 
I used to be, uh, I guess, the equivalent of a dean of faculty. Um, it wasn't quite as big as one of the faculties. But anyway, I was managing about 150 academics. And, um, I, it, and this was very normal, so it wasn't unusual. But I had a spreadsheet. And every individual member of staff, I would have a knowledge of what grant applications they were applying for or they were planning to apply for. And I would meet every month with the research office and they'd give me an update report on you know, the progress of individuals. And also with professors and senior academics, um, I would be sort of saying, well, why aren't you applying for this? I want your plan. You know, there was this just an expectation that, um, that academics, senior academics, people in positions of leadership should actually be applying for research grants and should be, you know, be much really active and they should be leading others and show an example. And obviously in the Czech Republic, that isn't the case. You can be a professor in the Czech Republic and really not, you know, there's no pressure on you to deliver, to do anything like that. But conversely, I also got much more support in Britain than we get here. And it comes, you know, um, and in all sorts of different ways, including, for example, um, when I was putting together my application for the ERC, um, you know, the research office organized, uh, and we had a complex uh, peer review system, internal peer review system, you know, and, um, and so I would give draft versions of the application and it was anonymous, so I didn't know who was reading my application, but they would give often quite hard comments about the application. They would say, yeah, this is interesting, this bit is boring, whatever, you know. And, and it comes back to what you were saying, Adela, that is that Czechs are not used to that kind of feedback. And I see that in Czech pub academic publishing as well, where peer review doesn't really exist. Certainly in the humanities, it doesn't exist. Um, and um, and that so that and, and not only that, but also when I was successful, I got an increase in my salary. And norm, it was quite normal if somebody got a really big grant, they would be promoted. And so you know that's the other reason. There's no, um, I don't think we have the right kind of motivation system or reward system for people in the Czech Republic to actually you know make it worth their while. So there's the fear of. Uh, failure plus the sense that they're not supported and i don't mean from from colleagues in the research office who i, I think um have worked really hard but supported from other academics um and um you know and particularly professors who, who don't always see they have a sense of responsibility towards younger colleagues and um and, and there's not necessarily the right kind of system for rewarding success either so people aren't given the right kind of motivations, you know, recognition for something they've achieved. I think, and all of these, I think, are really important. And I mean, it's not, it's certainly, you know, the British academic system is really problematic for other reasons, and it put too much pressure on people often. But I think in certain respects, that's, those, something like that is really important to get more people making applications, you know, because you can't, they won't do it on their own if, unless there's something for them and unless they'll get some recognition and support. Okay, thank you. So maybe going back to your application, to successful application, I mean, have you somehow planned to write ERC in different way than like the normal standard grants? Or was, was there was some difference or was it basically your standard way to write the grants? No, <laughs> I think that we learned today that ERC are very specific in how they are written, the B1, B2, how I think that this has been described in a very big details and I'm happy to talk about this over the emails or somebody wants to contact me uh, about uh, what were the tricks. Uh, so yes, so you don't write it as a regular Dutcher. Actually, I submitted the same year that I submitted my ERC, I took one third of it and submitted as a Dutcher that was successful. And now I have to actually finish it, end it, because my ERC will start uh, in January. So you write it in a different way. Um, so yeah, that was the question, yeah, I yeah, guess. But, yeah. but if you can, a little yeah. bit for, for the audience to explain mm -hmm. in which way is different. I mean, we, we know about yeah. the high raise, high gain. But yeah, no, so. I think 
in contrary to what you expect, it should be actually written in a very simple way. Because especially the B1 should be written that it's uh, even like not funny, funny, but like interesting, entertaining, a lot of graphics, kind of showing uh, you need to, of course, identify the knowledge there, find your uniqueness, you have to sell your model, you need to sell your expertise. This is all uh, important, but it has to be written in a simple way. So. What I did help a lot is my husband, who is American, who is native speaker, so it helps a lot. And I write the scientific text, and he completely rewrites it in a very simple way. One sentence. He hates my five-line sentences. He put them in a five different sentences. So what would be my recommendation when you are writing, especially the B1? Actually, I started with the B2, and then I extracted the essentials to B1. So I think that it really depends on who you are and how, what is your writing skills. I would not take it, uh, this for granted. So um, try to write it in a very simple way. And if you have nobody who can help you, write it and take a break one or two weeks and come back and then rewrite it and then take a break because you realize that what you wrote was very, for you, it was absolutely obvious what you are saying, but in two weeks you will forget all the details and you're like, oh, what, what did I mean by the sentence? The sentence makes no sense and you rewrite it. So find somebody who can really help you and if you don't have that person, take a really long time to write it and write it in a very simple way because <laughs> Somebody told me, and it's true, the panel members are extremely smart people, and they don't like to feel stupid. So if they don't understand your project, they will not like it because they will feel like, oh, this is something wrong. So, and if you write it simply, they will understand it, and they will put you on that B1 pile, and that's what you need to end it up. And in the interview, you can use your personal charms, and everything will be fine. So just take it into consideration, write it simply. Okay, Andre, if you can add something to that. Mathematics yeah, okay. will be different. <laughs> I am, I'm biologist, uh, so for me it's easier to write simply. <laughs> um, I, would, I would actually agree with you that uh, it's probably much more about like the big picture. Basically, having, having the idea and trying to sell it. And it's much less about uh, work packages, deliverables, number of publications, and this, this kind of basically bureaucracy that you have to do with, with all the other types of grants. So I guess, I guess that, that's one thing. And another thing that was, I guess, different for me, and maybe it shouldn't have been, I got like vastly more feedback from other people from you know, the university support, from Professor Strakos and, and like these kind of workshops, and from many people at our faculty. And that kind of hurt, but on the other hand, it made the proposal much better. So, and I, I guess this kind of feeds back to what you said also, right? That you really need a lot of feedback and a lot of rewriting, a lot of, lot of polishing. It's not like you write it. Uh, you will not write it in a month. That year, I write in two weeks, but the ERC, it took us much, much longer. But I would like to appreciate the workshops. I think that without the workshops, I would not get it. I think that the deadlines, they were for me crucial, because I had to start working on the project much, much, much earlier than I would have to if there would not be workshops. So uh, I think that they are amazing. They give you feedback, and they made you to start working on it, which is absolutely crucial, and a year ahead, actually. So. <laughs> yeah, they're they're tough on us, and, and and that's a good thing. So, Matthew, do you want to add something on on that? Well, uh, yeah, no, I I agree absolutely. The importance of being simple, because the thing is, the panel, uh, you know, you to get through to the second stage, um, you need to uh, obviously it needs to be passed or or, or put forward by the panel, and they won't necessarily be experts in your particular area. Um, they'll have, you know, often, uh, obviously they'll have broad disciplinary knowledge, um, but you cannot assume that they will understand, you know, for example, technical terms sometimes, they won't know. Or, um, and so it's really important to write it for the general uh, educated reader. I guess, I mean, obviously with, with some subjects it's really, really difficult, um, but certainly with the humanities, I mean, if somebody can't do that, then they need to examine what, you know, 
really think about what they're doing. But, um, and I think that's really important so that, yeah, as Alan has said, the panelists, if they, if they struggle to understand, then they'll just think, well, you know, you know, may, maybe actually you think, well, if this person can't express themselves, maybe they don't really know what they want to do either. They very, you know, that's, that's a re really, if somebody can't articulate what they're really trying to do, then uh, you think, well, are they going to produce good research? You know, so that's really quite important. And I, and I say that also because sometimes people can um, uh, hide or they kind of think that their application will have a kind will seem sophisticated if and as, at an appropriate level, if they give it a veneer of technical or theoretical jargon, but that doesn't, but you can see through that really quickly because sometimes you see these people will just sort of use, they're talking very general terms and it's really difficult to really get a sense of what are they really trying to do? You know, so that's important. So, but the other thing that Alan has said and Andre is, is really important is you have to take time. And, and I think that I can imagine that a lot of the reason a lot of people perhaps are not successful is that they think they can do it in a couple of months. It took me about nine months, you know. So really, if you're thinking of a consolidated grant, for example, what's the deadline? February. You should be thinking about consolidated grant for 2024, not 2023. You know, I shouldn't say that. You know, if you're just starting, <laughs> you want to apply? Yeah. Or apply or? <laughs> yeah, there may be some people now thinking, but I was just about to. But I mean, obviously there can be ex exceptions. But but I guess you know, even giving yourself three months is is uh, that's kind of you know, it's it takes more time because as Alan has said. You need to write it, you go away for a week or two, you come back to it, you know, and you give other people, they have to have time to kind of write it and read it, and, or not write it, but read it and so forth and give you feedback. It all takes a long time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. One more thing which I wanted to mention that really helped me. Uh, please ask your friends for successful ERC grants. We have 54 here now in the Czech Republic. I think that everybody will know somebody who will be willing to send you one or two. Uh, that helps amazingly if you can read a successful grant and take the essence out of it. Okay. That's yeah, it. good. Yeah, Thanks. I, I completely agree with that. <laughs> Like the, the access of, there even I, I was even able to Google some some applications <laughs> that are like out in the open, and and that really helped me to kind of see how it should look mm -hmm. like to basically learn by example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we can ask uh, again the support. Uh, what's about how to deal with this? Let's say time enough time to I mean to really force the applicants to have a, enough time I think there were two main messages or maybe three the one was to have enough time to write a success application and the second one was to be simple and clear so how do you think we can do it or do you have any some magic word for that or well <clears throat> there's no magic uh, there's motivation of the applicants so they have to want to do that uh, but what helps us a lot is uh, what uh, uh, what Professor Strakos is doing because that the, the workshop series really forces people to sit down and write some part at some particular times and uh, well otherwise uh, just you know just a request from some internal support would probably not be enough. Uh, we are also trying to Basically, uh, since Czechs are not so open to critical feedback sometimes, we are trying to use our whatever internal schemes we have to force people to accept some feedback on their ideas and more elaborate uh, drafts of the, of the proposal. Of course, in time, that could also help uh, force them to work a bit faster. But I really said, talking about the time to, to write the proposal, it's all nice. In the end, it doesn't take that long to write the proposal, but the proposal has to be, well, it will change, but it has to be in the mind or the experimental design uh, has to be ready by the time when, uh, when the applicant starts writing. Because we have people all the time, repeatedly, coming like three months before the deadline, okay, I want to write the uh, ERC proposal. And with some, it will work fine, because they know what project they want to implement. But in some cases, they come these three months before the deadline and they don't have the project and they start writing and they encounter, okay, so 
uh, have some ideas. Maybe it's absolutely not worth one and a half million euros or, or whatever. So I have to expand. How do I do that? Just add numbers. And in the end, the, usually um, it would seem like, okay, the, the methodology and the, the, the detailed design of the experiment comes into B2, but it does project back in, in B1. So if somebody has not thought in detail about the methodology and the approach, how, to, how, how they will achieve their uh, objectives, you know, the pathway, nice pathway from methods, data to, 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 to achievement object, uh, of objectives, if they have not thought about it in advance, if they don't have it ready, it will be absolutely perfectly visible also in B1. It will be, there will be gaps in, uh, in, in B1 uh, too. So I, I support the idea of starting writing with, with B2, even though some people might not want to do that. But the, the point behind this is mainly that, okay, you can start writing B1. Uh, uh, you don't have to have B1 in the ERC form, but you have to know what experiment you are going to do, what, what approach have you chosen to, to, to do your project. You have to know this very well in detail. You probably need, in many uh, fields, you, you, you should already have a lot of uh, preliminary data and some verification of the approaches that you, uh, that you will be doing. So it's not about like three, even six months before the deadline starting writing. It's about much longer preparation of, of the project concept and the experimental design. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Adela, do you want to add something on that? Yeah, um, I'm starting to be a bit repetitive, but again, I think that the most important thing is the institutional background, and I mean at the level of the faculties and institutes, so the researcher have enough time and space to concentrate on ERC grant, because it's it, it requires tremendous uh, amount of time. And what we can do from the central level, because I, di I didn't say that, but, but I'm from the central level, so I should actually uh, uh, consulting all the 17 faculties we have if there would be ERC applicants. So uh, what we do is that we um, we provide uh, some financial remuneration to those who applied for ERC and they submitted a good a good quality grant no matter what the result is. So that's something what can be done from the central level uh, as a small appreciation uh, and, and to let the researchers know that we know that this requires uh, a lot of time, but uh, it is uh, essential that the faculty uh, or the institute uh, knows who are the people suitable for ERC, not just now in this call, but in a perspective of two years, five years maybe, and to work with them and, and to, make, to make it uh, as much as, uh, as as easy as possible for them, not to you know, not to chase any other grants, not to distract uh, the concentration, and be able to really focus on ERC. Mm -hmm. So also, it was mentioned here that okay, you, you you need to have very good idea, but also the important is to transfer it or transmit it in the proposal in very clear way or simple way. Do you have any suggestion for, because it's known that Czechs, we are not uh, the best in the communication at all. And, uh, so do you have any idea to, or any practice to, with, with your applicants, how to uh, shape the, the proposal that it will be more, it will be clear, simple and, and, and well understood even for non-expert? Yeah, we have, uh, I think, quite um, uh, well procedure. We also have many leaflets and brochures just to as a very first step just to you know introduce the ERC and letting know to researchers what ERC is and what are requirements and uh, we have a, a whole uh, website dedicated to ERC so our researchers know how to proceed what is approximate timeline uh, who they should contact um, as a first step so um, at the first, uh, at the first part, they consult with me. I give them uh, uh, remarks based on uh, the practice because I, uh, I'm not researcher, obviously, but I've seen many, many proposals and many successful projects. So I have kind of 
uh, at least bit I know how how it should look like. So and when my uh, when my uh, mental capacity is not sufficient anymore, I um, uh, hand over uh, to Zdeněk Strakos, who has uh, and I always said that he has a superpower that that he cannot really go into any proposal of any kind of any uh, field. It doesn't matter to him. He's a mathematician, but he can, you know, uh, he could evaluate proposal from theology or whatever. So, and then the, there is a tremendous work of uh, expert group for ERC grants and, and uh, the workshops uh, which are um, uh, done together with Technology Center and uh, then mock interviews when uh, people coming to the second round. So. I would say that this is the best practice. We have the best practice here in place, but we need to, you know, to maybe better communicate to researchers what it, what ERC requires and what are these steps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can so, I add something? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, go sure, ahead. Sure, go ahead. Uh, uh, this obviously doesn't work for the natural sciences, I think. Well, maybe it might do as well. I don't know, but. Um, I, I think that the um, um, applications, and I can say this as a reviewer as well, um, that the, within the humanities are most convincing is the ones where they, they the, the applicant has, has approached it in terms of uh, an exercise in storytelling in a way. And we always, you know, always tend to ask, well, what's the narrative behind the research? What's the motivating kind of problem or question or whatever? Um, and, I, and I've seen, and, and certainly that was what was central to my, my um, uh, application, was trying to construct a certain kind of narrative, historical, a historical or art historical narrative, and then being able to, to um, uh, you know, construct obviously what, what seemed like a convincing line of inquiry that would, would resolve the issue. And, and, and I think that often pe people that just think of their application just presenting facts, for example, or information, or just saying what they're going to do without a sense of what the narrative is, the coherence of it as a kind of proposition. Um, I think that's because I'm, I'm saying that because you asked about communication, you know, so you have the formal requirements of the scheme, but it's also this ability to, to engage with it, in, as I say, in terms of some kind of uh, 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 have a clear kind of narrative so so that the panelists can understand, oh, so that's what you're getting at, that's what you're trying to achieve. And, and certainly um, the, the most recent panel I was on, um, the, the ones that were did the best that, uh, and got through to the second round were, were those that, that tended to have the most, you know, had a convincing narrative and often ones that didn't, just you just weren't quite clear what they were trying to do, uh, really. Yep. Yeah, I can. So it's an, you know, it's an exercise in advocacy, actually, and I think people don't necessarily think of it in that way. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's a good point because I mean, as a, as a, as a member of panel, I remember when I was reading like this fifty proposals, and that that was really a nightmare. And if the proposal was written in very bad way, basically you gave up very quickly. Um, anyway, so. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so can you can you somehow explain a little bit more when you got this idea? And, and now we talk about basically how to shape the, the text, no, the, about the narrative. So how to make it attractive even for non-specialists? How how you manage this? Or I mean, you already mentioned a few tricks, but if you can give more. <laughs> I mean, that place I will have to go into more specific on my grant that uh, deals with intracellular communication, which sounds already quite sexy. So that was easy. And then, so we work on a specific parasite trypanosomes, and they are unique in a sense that they have a single mitochondrion and we can look how the mitochondrion communicates uh, with the rest of the cells. And then when I was reading mammalian papers, cancer papers, there are, oh my gosh, there's so many phenotypes, they contradict each other because it's a complex system, there's too many studies. And I realized that our model can be very simple and can actually answers the most fundamental questions, how the cell communicates with its own organelles in this unique small organism. And so 
I was dead in, uh, excited by this idea like two or three years ago, and then I applied for Expro grant, and I got very bad reviews, and that helped, <laughs> because um, it, I didn't have that idea published yet, so it also was not, but um, it helped. It helped in a way that uh, something was not understood, I was not going into specifics, it was too broad, so I refocused myself. What I wanted to say here that applying for the grants is never lost time. You can always recycle the grant for something else. And actually the time that you spend thinking about the grant, that's the most, for me, is actually the most enjoyable time of the whole academic year. So. Apply, you get wrong feedback, uh, you don't get wrong feedback, you get a feedback, learn from it and go. So my idea was shaping for at least two or three years. And then the last year I was getting into more specific. I even have a notebook when I was writing certain things, you know, so I don't forget. And it was shaping actually what I was first presenting the workshop, the grant was at the end very different. So it's just you need time to distillate the idea. So, and then ERC is beautiful in a sense that if you can say, I can answer some fundamental biological question, that you are already halfway there. So that, I think that I got kind of lucky that I found this niche that we can now actually explore, and hopefully it will be fruitful explorations. <laughs> it seems like the good ERC proposal is like good goulash which cannot be cooked in one hour. It has yeah. to take at least <laughs> one night. <laughs> Okay, Andre, if you please can yeah. also. Uh, okay, so, yeah, I must say that I don't really enjoy thinking about, like, <laughs> you know, far away things. I, I enjoy essentially, like, building things, I mean, programming stuff. So it was pretty hard to me to, to work with this idea, but I guess, yeah, it, it also, like, took a lot of time to form. Uh, but it's kind of... And I think that this was also a good, good or I, I, I hope I, I don't really know. Uh, uh, I think that this was also a, like a good, uh, good uh, property of, of my proposal was that it was kind of trying to fill the gap in current state of the art or trying to like specifically address the problems of like what, what current research in, in my area is, is having. So essentially trying to like fix some problems and and show that you can do it in like a in an elegant way uh, should okay. definitely help. Uh, maybe also like connecting it to some practical applications. So in, in my case is it's natural language generation. So like, you know, having a database table and trying to describe it in, in like a fluent sentence. And uh, that has some application. You can s say that you know th th there's stuff like you can you can talk to your phone or something like that, and it's 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 a direct application of that, and you you show that you can improve it. So these these bits I think should help to kind of like sell the sell the proposal. Yeah. Obviously, it has to be like internally coherent as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Matthew, do you wanna say something on that? Um, we already kick up with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> Just, you know, if you had... <laughs> okay. So, maybe Ladislav, because now, I mean, we, we saw that here we have a successful ap applicants, but each of them is a, is it's own person, so it has, it's slightly different, and you work with many people. So, but if you... Because then you have a perspective that you, you see that there are many people and they have different approaches, but probably to have a success grant, means that there is something common, no? Do, do you see something which is in common? Like, of course, bright idea and... Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, well, hard to say uh, that uh, uh, ERC, successful ERC applications have actually something in common. They have very flexible architecture, you know? There's almost no template at all, which is good. And you can get creative and... Uh, I, I try to keep myself from telling people that whatever approach they choose is, uh, is uh, bad. I definitely cannot judge the scientific idea, that's one thing for sure. So I may somehow feel it's like not the perfect thing, but, but I try to keep myself from telling uh, things like that because I, I can't, can't know, can't say for sure. But I. Um, uh, that's 
probably what Matthew means with uh, with narrative. You know, I, I tend to call it for myself in some simple, uh, simple, simpler uh, uh, ways, like trying to to push people when I read the ground, give them feedback to to uh, have them identify the pathway they will use to to achieve the project objectives. Quite often I see applications uh, that, at least in the beginning, don't have a clear connection between what they want to achieve and the methods they use or the, or, or, or the actual activities that they do. And I think here, uh, th this is the place where, where many proposals actually fail, that they have not really thought it through. They, they say, okay, I, I, I need a breakthrough idea. I need breakthrough research. So I will propose a breakthrough objective. They name some breakthrough objective, probably interesting, but they don't have the right, they often don't have the right tools uh, to, to address the problem, to get to the objective. And then they start proposing experiments. That's that are usually the things that they somehow are convinced that they can perform, they can do, and uh, um, they, they don't connect them well uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the actual objective. So there's not the story that, okay, here is how it unfolds uh, that I am getting to achievement of the objective. So that, that's the thing that needs a lot, of, uh, a lot of thinking, a lot of reiterations. That's why the, the, the time is needed. And uh, yeah, that's why you need to start with a, a complete idea in mind, even if it changes uh, uh, throughout. But the, the, the main thing is that the process is, uh, yeah. in its nature, reiterative. So if you have uh, enough time, you can usually squeeze something out of most, uh, uh, most initial ideas. Yeah. Uh, and if okay, may end up that it gets rejected, you get the feedback, and the process continues. And uh, yeah, I, I must say that uh, uh, the ERC applications, and it was mentioned several times, they, they, the, the process of uh, uh, preparing an ERC application helped uh, quite a few people towards junior star or expro grants. And uh, then the next iteration again is ERC, and they, uh, the, their proposals will sure be better after uh, after a few years. Okay, Adela, do you want to uh, mention something about this common idea, so signatures of the successful ERC grants? What, what if there's something like that? No. no I think that Ladia actually mentioned the, the most important things. Mm -hmm. So, but maybe I can ask you also because when one of the important parts is is this uh, self evaluation or this uh, track record, and I think in Czech Republic we are. I mean, everyone hates uh, many or, or most of the people they hate to write something positive about themselves. No, and, and that's I, I I found it. This is kind of critical part of your. Then you have to. Write, I'm very good, and I'm I'm the world leading, and so so. I think there it's probably you guys, you have to help a lot no, or push a lot to, to really... What, what would be your suggestion how to write this part or how to start with? Because as, as I said, I, I think in Czech Republic we are not very self-confident, but we need to do it because we need to convince uh, these uh, this reviewers and, and panelists, uh, but of, of course not overshoot. So it, what what is the good practice here? Yeah, I always tell to the, the applicants not to evaluate themselves, really to avoid um, any sentences like I'm the best, I'm, I'm, because it's self-evaluation is not really appropriate, I would say, but I rather advise them to, to write the track record. Well, track record can be written in many ways. It could be bullet points or uh, it could be the story. I always like more the the storytelling when there is a really story of the of the person when you can see how how passionate uh, he is about what he do um, uh, how he developed uh, in in the last years what he achieved and so on but always advice uh, I, I always advise to avoid the self evaluation just to demonstrate uh, how good I am on on the concrete uh, actions publications uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. 
Ladislav, do you have something to add on this? I mentioned that I worked for, for SATEC uh, at Masaryk University, which is Life Science uh, uh, Institute. And then I shifted to, uh, to rectorate. So now, now I work as Adela for the whole, uh, whole university. And after encountering the humanities, I learned not to judge. <laughs> it's so difficult to compare whatever profiles. So, uh, uh, so, so profiles uh, competitive for uh, for ERC can be very diverse. I think it doesn't um, uh, it doesn't hurt to show a bit of passion also in in, in maybe the track record or, or or the profile for for the topic for for the team. And uh, yeah, I, I think. Uh, it's it's very very uh, individual. Yeah, Andre, how do you deal with this this uh, tref, track record? Was it difficult to write it, or what you would suggest to further applicants? <laughs> I know that yeah. e every field I, is a little bit special, yeah, no? But yeah, I'd say yeah, I I kind of agree with. <laughs> Uh, uh, with what has been said, uh, especially with like let let the facts speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. So you, you you don't like have to say I'm the best. You you can say that whatever I I don't know like organ organized this this thing or I, I I made this experiment and I showed this. So that that, that might might look better. Uh, the other thing is yeah, it's it's again probably you're you're again telling a story. You're, you know, you're telling a story about the proposal, you're telling a story about yourself somehow. So you, you still need to frame it in a, in a positive way, but, uh, but it, it's good it's, if, if, if it's basically you're, you're letting the facts speak for, mm -hmm. for themselves. So, Alena, do you want to add something? I would just say focus on achievements, like try to highlight the things that you are proud of. and. Um, for women, it's always, especially if they are, have a family, it's also good to mention that you are able to balance the work and life. Uh, I think that it's uh, kind of nice and also shows that um, uh, you can work on the both fronts. But um, uh, find as something that's also specific for you, that's something unique, and then highlight that in light that you became a PI at too early age and you realized that it was too early for you and then you learn from that. Or mention mentors that, for example, were influential and had an influence on you. Mention them because, again, it shows like how you can learn from the history. Um, mention specific places that you visited and uh, had an effort on you. So make it personal and focus on achievements and kind of stand out because everybody can list publications. But if you write something uh, more personal, I think that it's better, it's read better and, and they will remember you because they will be like, ah, that's the one that she did something to. <laughs> Matthew, Matthew, do you want to add something on that or what was your approach to writing? Yeah, well, just two things and one was to reinforce what Adela said which is that um, you, you know, the panelists won't like it if you tell them what you should, what they should think about you, you know. So if you, it's no good saying I'm the best this or that, you know, because the panelists will say, well, we're the ones that decide that, not you. Um, and it's really important to, to not kind of en enter into that boastfulness. The, just the other thing, I think is less is more, you know, so sometimes um, it's just important don't fill it with stuff, you know, just be very selective and only highlight or include what will have the biggest impact rather than imagining that if you fill your track record with stuff that somehow that will look impressive because it doesn't because sometimes then and, and, and I've seen lots of examples of people who it's actually difficult to get a sense of their track record because they they haven't presented it very clearly and they haven't distinguished between the trivial and the important um, and that's really important as well because then again it gives you some sense of maybe their qualities as a researcher <laughs> so yeah thank you i think this is very important so now yeah another thing that well often uh, appears is that okay it's uh, sometimes 
useful to note to people not to write their stuff that they want the, don't want the evaluators to see or evaluate. They tend to uh, write their CV complete with both positive and negative, mm -hmm. and they, then they ask how to hide the negative. You know, <laughs> just not writing it, not not putting it there, uh, is sometimes enough. <laughs> so it <laughs> complies with what, what Matthew said. <laughs> yeah, good. So now, if you look back, I mean, how how this ERC changed your life? I mean, of course, you got a lot of money, but. Uh, how how this change? What what, what what do you think behind of the benefit of recognition? Let's say like this, that you are an ERC recipient. But if you look back when you start to write it, uh, do you think it was worse not only for let's say these incomes, but also that you see that you change completely your mind or you you change or you develop scientifically? No. no. <laughs> um. Um, it's diff difficult questions. Uh, somebody, everybody can understand in a different way. So, if I understand if the ERC changed the way how I do research, uh, then I would say no. And I think that because I was already in the ERC consolidator uh, category, and I think that actually the way how I do research it helped to receive this grant. So it's not about, uh, I'm actually proud about how we do our research. How it changed, it, uh, it will start in January, so I didn't get the money yet. Uh, so it's difficult for me to say how it will change me, but probably not too much. Um, I think that uh, for me, the main motivation was to get five years funding for an uh, idea that I had. So to keep my team, to maintain my team, to hire new people, to get uh, good people to my team. So it will be an exciting period, but we will pretty much continue in the same way as we did in the last uh, 10 years now. So, and I, yes, it was a happy moment when I realized it, but on the other hand, you know, the world is still turning and we are just researchers and we are humbled. It's, uh, it's actually amazing what happened, but it, you know, I was also very fortunate and lucky because this year a lot of PI couldn't accept the drug because of the Switzerland mess and because of the UK. So I also feel that I applied in the right time. Um, so yeah, so I think we should be just humbled by that and just continue to do the science the way that we do and, con yeah. and go on. Yeah. Andre, so for you was, I mean, if you look back, when you start to think about the grant about, and how was your research and now, uh, if, if this basically, I'm, I'm not talking about the award, but more about like the process when you start to think about the apply ERC, if this somehow you see that there is a shift in, in your vision to what you want to do or it, it, it's I, just you continue? I, mean, I, I guess it's probably, there's probably not such a big change in how I do my research. I'd say it, the ERC kind of, um, made me to look a bit further ahead, I guess. So kind of a bit, bit more look at a bit, bit more a big picture and, and, and look at a bit more like general solutions. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's probably like a, like a slight shift, but I say, say it, it's relatively slight. And the thing is, I was, I was essentially doing basic research before and, and I, was, I had quite a lot of freedom in the, in the Charles University Primus grant. So uh, I guess, it's it's like not such a not such a huge change to to what I what I did previously, but uh, yeah, I, I I'd say I'm, I'm or at least I try to look a bit bit more a bit more like ahead or in, 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 at, at the big picture. So, so if I can ask like the, the uh, from from the support, I mean, do you, when when you see when you start to work with these people which wants to apply. Many of them, you said that they don't have clear idea, but do you think it, this process to start to write ERC is worse, even though you basically now, you are probably not on the best uh, position to get this, but it may change your, uh, your research, or how do you see these people, how they evolve, or many of them, if they evolve, of just uh, in, in terms of, of uh, thinking about the research? Uh, well, it always gives them some space to think about research in more long-term perspective. So in, in, in general, we try to support everyone to, to go through the process of, uh, of designing such a project and tuning such a project. Uh, 
and I believe it's uh, it's helpful. It's helpful for everyone because it sometimes can give them um, new energy for for what they do in the future and uh, a bit of different perspective. And uh, yeah, maybe even like. Um, uh, being more open to, to, to feedback and such things if they get involved in the wo workshops or our internal uh, support. We're trying to push them to, to, to do that and it's definitely a us useful uh, thing to be more open to, to, to exchange of ideas nice. with, with other people. So Adela, do you, do, you, do you have some experience with or do you have some opinion about uh, if this kind of like uh, writing process can, even though you will not be success in a, in application, it will improve your research. Do you think is that case? Yeah, I think hundred percent, hundred percent. I I heard from many people who uh, tried to get ERC, uh, even repeatedly, and and in the end they didn't get it. They always or almost always came back to me and told me that the that the process itself was totally essential and it it changed actually their their view on their own research mm -hmm. so i mean we we already discussed a lot and the, the whole day but probably we should close up with uh, some recommendation also make you if you what what would be let's say the main message or main recommendation for for the people who are now listening and, and they uh, they want to apply for erc what would be your recommendation do it, do it. Do it, okay. <laughs> um, and, and also, uh, I, I think it's, uh, coming back to what I said at the beginning, I, I know that, you know, certainly talking from our project officer um, uh, and various other people, I mean, the ERC are really concerned to uh, increase the number of applications from Central and Eastern Europe, you know, and, and I think there's a uh, a great deal of sympathy and willingness to to see more applications um, and I think it's really important to to, to try it because as I say it, it's uh, I, I think it's probably different to the natural sciences but certainly the humanities lots of people still have this sort of view that there's some kind of not exactly conspiracy but you know there's some sort of uh, I don't know, patronizing attitude or something. And, and it's just not true. It really isn't. Um, you know, and I think it's really important to try, you know, to, to make a mark. Adela, do you have some recommendation? Something, some, what you would like to say to the future applicants in Charles University? Uh, well, just get informed uh, as soon as possible. Uh, as soon as possible, you, you know you are going to apply even in one year, two year, never it's too early to come for advice and start to cooperate. Mm -hmm. So you? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's difficult. It has been a long day, but um, yeah, I would say just go for it. Don't be afraid to ask uh, for the support and take it from the perspective that it's never a lost time and you will have material for three Dutchers. So... <laughs> It will be good. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I guess I don't, don't, don't have much else, but I'd say, uh, yeah, get some uh, examples, look at how, how other people have done it, and get all the feedback and all the support you can. Involve your students, involve uh, like your senior colleagues, get feedback, feedback from, from anyone who is willing to have a look. So let you slough, final word. Yeah, we have the same concerns in uh, the support offices. I would say start early, connect with us as soon as you can, uh, and uh, then you can think it over for, for some longer time, but you will have some perspective and information to work with if you get in contact and, and have a meeting with us, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have some questions now, or we can open discussion for, for the public? We have uh, two questions on Slido, so I will read uh, the first one. How did you get your ERC idea? I feel overwhelmed by constant research duties, lab work, supervising students, teaching. Any ideas how to find some extra time? <laughs> no. <laughs> 
It's it's difficult. We all work too much and we do it to ourselves. Uh, so it's usually been born within your own research. I know that we heard today that it, it cannot be incremental, that it has to be something novel, but it's still it do not be born within your research. You will not you will not get it on a completely different topic. So just uh, be creative when you are reading papers and open-minded. And yeah, with the timing, I also wish that the day would have 48 hours. Believe me, but it's it's what we have. Yeah, I, I yeah I also think yeah look look at your research think about the, the problems that you've been having that other people have been having and how to how how would you try and solve them maybe talk about it with other people talk about with uh, about it with your students uh and yeah i, I completely agree with the the fact that yeah it's like the, this like it's not going to be something completely new. There, there are like no new ideas uh, <laughs> in the universe. So uh, it's 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 always going to be kind of connected to something that you've already done. Matthew, do you want to add something on that? How do you come up to your idea? Um, oh God, I can't remember. But I, but I mean, well, it was some. It did actually emerge from previous project. But I was there was a book that's just been published in the states called The Slow Academic. And, uh, and it's kind of uh, like a guide on emphasizing how important it is to, um, to slow down in academic life. And I, and I do think that m maybe, um, I and mean, we all have pressures on our time, but, but maybe it is important to, to learn. Sometimes we, we have choices about things that we accept, we agree to do and things you know, that we could say no to. And I think maybe it's just important to kind of be a bit more strategic about where we put our efforts, where we spend our time, so that we, we we do manage to create the space to actually think about our research. You know, for example, uh, uh, something that struck me in the Czech Republic is I think people publish too much. They publish too many articles. They publish too many short articles that really uh, are not really of much substance. They can't be because they're short. You know, and I think it's. It's important. There's a kind of a culture, maybe, of overproduction, and, th and that may be where you start. Learn to say no to things. You know, if you're invited to contribute to a book or an edited volume, learn to say no. You know, it's not going to make much difference if you don't do it. Uh, you know, just to create a bit of time um, out of your obligations, just for yourself, and to think hard about your own research and where it's going. Yeah. Thank you. Very good point. So, next question. And uh, the next question is rather about the process of applying to our workshops. So, the question is, I guess the call of ERC starting round will be open in July 2023. How much mature should be the proposal prior to registration to the first workshop so in the spring? Yet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The coordinator of the ERC expert group uh, will answer. Thank you very much. Uh, well, it's a good question. Uh, if I would say it should be finished, that's uh, <laughs> too ambitious. But uh, uh, definitely, I think by the registration, your CV and the track record should be in a level that you would be able to submit it next day. And we'll be very tough on that, much more, much tougher than we were in the past, because that's the main drawback. The people are trying to finish the track record and, and, and the CV much too late. And uh, then there is no time to refine the proposal, because people still are working on the track, track record and CV, and that, that should be finished. I mean, a uh, year ago, it should be clear if I'm going to apply, so what's, what's the matter? I mean, just can be updated. So that's the one thing, CV and the track record in a perfect uh, way, state, uh, following the rules of ERC, not following bureaucratically, I mean formally, because it allows to change and to use the, use the template, but to a reasonable level, but should be rock solid already. Of course, some changes are allowed in the process and will be, but, but it should, in this way, you will have more time for the proposal, and you will help us to help you. 
And that's very important because simply we are then exhausted by, by say, correcting trivial errors. I mean, Pavel can confirm that. <laughs> and uh, second, as for the proposal, it has been mentioned many times that you should live with this idea of the proposal for a long time. So at the time of the registration for the first workshop, the idea should be crystal clear. You should be able to explain your idea in the abstract format in such a way that it is clear what you are going to do, why you are going to do it, and that it really makes sense to apply for the ERC. So that are the rules which we apply when we are deciding whom to accept for the workshops. Okay? But this is not about the workshop, this is not about I really like the comments that you had, it pleased me that it helps you, then we enforce you, but, but you are not doing it because of us, but because of, of, the, of the work itself. And maybe this allowed me to make one comment that I wanted to say at the very end. You know, perhaps from myself, it was, it was a very good day for me. I have, I've learned a lot. I was very pleased to see, to hear the opinions of other people. And for me, the take home message that uh, uh, I think uh, we all can consider and, and to try to help with is it has been articulated many times here that uh, we are having troubles, in particular here in the Czech Republic, to, to hear that some critique, to, to get the, the say some opinion that doesn't please our egos. And, but that's the essence of, of, of this. That's what the ERC is really helping the, the general thing, the, the whole, say, society in the way, because this is important to have the egos under control for the scientists in particular. And uh, then we are starting with these workshops. At the first workshop we are saying, and now I'm talking on behalf of all or our colleagues, we are saying, well, first we have to make an agreement. You are here at the workshops and we'll be straight, we'll be tough, we'll tell you what we really think. We don't do it because we wish to exercise our own egos. We'll do it because of you. And we should try to create in the society this feeling which I think is evaporating in some way, that who is the friend? Friend is giving you, is telling you the truth. Not because of whatever the personality of the friend, but because she or he cares. And we try to care for our ERC applicants. That's why we're doing that. And this is very, very important. So we'll have more of this attitude. We'll also have more ERC grants. Thank you. No more questions? One more, One more. okay. Please tell something about your presentation in front of the Commission, some weird or standard questions you received. It concerns uh, the interview in the second round. Oh, do you want to okay, start? Can I, can I say something? Yeah, because uh, I mean, I've, I've rehearsed the, the presentation like many times at the, at the specific workshop for the presentation with some senior members of our, of our faculty, uh, with, with lots of people. And I, I rehearsed everything like up to up to the second, and I think I did pretty well with the presentation. But the, the questions were uh, like it was so harsh, <laughs> essentially targeting all the like the weakest points of the proposal. And I, I mean, there are always some weak points. So it was uh, you know th th there are lists of questions for which. You're kind of supposed to prepare like the, the frequently asked questions at, at ERC panels. For me, it was just about specific, very specific questions about the proposal, and basically kind of presenting me, okay, but this is this is what the uh, you know what the reviewers found as a problem. How do you how do you respond to that? You obviously don't have the <laughs> reviews prior to the uh, to uh, to the interview, so so you really have to kind of I guess give the proposals to someone who hasn't seen it and, and have them kind of find the weak spots, I suppose. Because I, I really wasn't prepared for that and I, I felt like I was really incoherent during the, 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 uh, uh, the interview. Uh, 
apparently I, I, I convinced them, but I didn't convince myself, to be honest. And the other thing is, I, I got absolutely no feedback to my responses. So it was, I, I, I just, I re responded to, to the question, and they told me, okay, thank you, next question. So it's, it's, it's really hard. No, when you say it, it's true, it's actually true. The interview, I, yeah, I can go for a beer and talk to you about it, because that, it was harsh. Uh, I, I didn't sleep a, a, for a week after it, because I was so mad at myself that I completely ruined it. They, yes, so they asked me why trypanosomes, and if I think that I can discover something new with trypanosomes, and it made me just very mad, because with trypanosomes, we already discovered so many different processes, RNA editing, transplicing, and, I, and when I got mad, I got very emotional, and I was trying to tell them that they are completely wrong, and so I think that you just have to be yourself, but they asked me about how I will validate my data. I'm like, oh my gosh, I said, how? Not that I will do some knockout, and I just, and there was this lady, in the dark corridor. I think that she was in a basement or something, and she was dark and old, and she was looking at me. And again, you don't, you don't, you don't get any feedback from them. My first ERC interview, I went to Brussels, and okay, that was interesting experience, and I was not ready. I was too young. It, so, but this time, I, I was ready. I was so. I knew it, that this project is worth it. And yeah, no, I didn't have that feeling from the committee. <laughs> but obviously, as you said, I convinced them and not myself. But yeah, it's, you have, just have to be yourself, but it's, it's not fun. Thank no. you. <laughs> uh, I was lucky I didn't have an interview. Oh, you didn't have an interview. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, I think it's probably the last year that, they, that you yeah, didn't. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think it was just because it was an advance grant. But yeah. But actually, but I, I have to say, I have to say, it was also a nightmare for the panelists, you know, to 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 make interview. It's both sides, <laughs> <laughs> and especially in advance grant, you know, we were refused to to have an interview because then you interview your peers. And <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to add because thank you very much for sharing this experience. But this is exactly what ERC is about. Uh, it's absolutely great if you get passionate during your interview because that's what ERC wants to see. But on the other hand, maybe it might not look like that, but the people in the room, sometimes they are passionate too. And you would not believe, I just wanted to encourage everybody because they, they are harsh, but they are harsh because they love the science. That's what we have in common. So it's not like really there is nobody who wants to hurt you or to, to be, you know, I don't know, unpolite or something like that. They are fighting really very much. And after you just uh, turn off the screen and the computer, they are fighting even more so sometimes. It's, it's not a joke, there were people crying in other panels, not in mine, because their proposal they liked just didn't go through, so sometimes it gets really emotional. So this is, this is a good thing about it, and I think that uh, even if it doesn't look good, it's just that they don't have, they don't, they don't have enough time to, um, to, to give you a feedback for your response, because there are four other waiting and want to ask their questions, because they are really passionate about it, and sometimes it's just like this. I just did very quickly to, to uh, uh, confirm that, uh, you know, the fights are sometimes very deep, very bitter, very hard. And but what is beautiful on that, that when the case ended, that means when it is decided, the case ends. So I remember we always then, we went together for dinner or something and the case was totally over. It was not at all personal because it was about the matter, about the issue, not about who won, who lost. That was so refreshing being at the ERC, very tiring but very refreshing from that point of view. in the room or you can of course still use Slido. Perhaps we can um, give the last round, uh, like um, give the floor to our PIs and uh, representatives of institutions if they have any last remarks they would like to share with us. I think that I have 
that's enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Wait. Don't be afraid and, and don't be afraid of feedback. Yeah, and uh, um, as uh, you were asking about the workshops of the expert group, please don't forget that before signing up for the expert group, you should contact your local uh, support and have them brief you on what the ERC is about or find out some more information, but f surely you should be in contact before. So and go ahead, it's, it's great actually. Much before. Well, we should be contact for years. <laughs> but it, it's it's true. It doesn't uh, always happen, but it's 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 of quite often so that okay, people come. They have some pretty bad draft. They say okay, well, there would be too much to be to be improved in for the, for the current uh, um, period. But maybe we try junior star this this year with some feedback that, that I've just received and. Next year or the year after, I start again uh, for the ERC, and the idea matures. So it can take years for sure. We don't have as well structured pipeline as, as uh, some faculties of Charles University or Charles University as a whole, but the principle is pretty much the same. We, we know about people uh, who, who get in contact with us and, and feed them uh, information, and uh, when the time is ripe, they can join the workshops. Any further comments? If not, then we have reached the end of today's event. I'd like to thank all of you for, uh, for participation. Um, I'd like to thank especially to our co-organizers, uh, the ERC Executive Agency and Charles University, as well as all the experts um, who actively participate in the ERC expert group for supporting Czech applicants. And I look forward to meeting many of you, hopefully during workshops in the spring. So good luck with your proposals and see you hopefully during another occasions on ERC or MSCA. Thank you and have a nice evening. Before we will just uh, go home, I'd like to thank Lida, the team at the T Technology Center, who was making this all organization is a lot of work and uh, also many other duties. So I, I, I really uh, I cannot express more the gratitude towards Lida how she is doing. She took over. Know the, the job after Zuska and, and Petra, who are now on maternity, maybe they are listening to us now. So, so greetings to them and the babies. So, and she took over in the summer, and it was just fantastic because it was just jumping into the deep water. And also to the team at the Charles University, Eva Matej so I sitting over there in the back, you know, uh, hiding, yes. So the same thing, so they make this available, and without them, that would not be possible. And to all of you who came, so give our greetings to Brno, to Budjovice, to everywhere. We are very happy to, to have you with us. And uh, as, as we have mentioned before already, uh, it's like an ERC family, in this community in the Czech, and let, let's let it, let it grow. Let's let it grow as fast as possible. So thanks to all of you, thanks to Professor Valkarova and Jana Shitova for all this. And, and uh, uh, we, we look forward to good news from you next year, year after that. Okay? Thanks a lot.